guys. Oh. Once other real car manufacturers start building EVs, you'll get an EV with a Jaguar or a BMW effectively thrown in for free. Should it become a national government issue? Of course it should. The idea that local boroughs should be responsible, well, you know, those boundaries don't make any sense whatsoever. As Birmingham Council is uh, bankrupt, just can we put a bid in for it? Can we buy Birmingham? What? How does that work? Hello, and welcome to the Collecting Addicts podcast, episode number 61. I'm not telling you any statistic about the number 61, because I tried it two minutes ago and it went wrong, and I'm re-recording this. So Chris Cooper can foxtrot Oscar straight away. Here we go. Um... <laughs> We're going to start with the bane of all of our lives. I believe it's the only topic that unites every single person that uses roads in the UK, be they cyclists, illegal moped users, supercar drivers, lorry drivers. It is, of course, potholes. There's no one in this country that likes a pothole. I, I believe that's a fair statement. Neil Clifford, how do you feel about potholes? Look, not to be dramatic, I'm never, I can never be accused of being dramatic or over exaggerating things, but it's it's completely bloody ridiculous, isn't it? There's these potholes are the size of being in London in 1945. You know, I'm old enough. My mum had me when I was, when she was 44, bless her. So my mum was in the war and she used to tell me about how they used to sort of try to rebuild London in the late 40s. It's like that driving to work at the moment i live out in the countryside and it, it's um some of these potholes are about four inches deep they're even on the m25 now aren't they and yeah. what i find i suppose what i'm curious about because i'm sure there are thousands of people working for us as taxpayers in the local councils with coming up with all these wonderful plans and wonderful new machines that are going to fix these things for us i'm sure that is all being done but I haven't seen one person fixing a pothole in the last six months. And even two or three years ago, you see these you see these machines out, wouldn't you, with, you know, blowing out all the dust and filling it full of new tarmac and flattening it down and men doing the work. And I was all quite proud to be, you know, part of a country that was relatively organised and not a third world country. But now I, I, I think everyone's just given up, haven't they? You know, I think it's there is there is a there is a reason for this. No, the well, I, look, the 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 car is not the enemy. The van is not the enemy. The lorry is not the enemy. You know, these it runs the country, doesn't it? The yeah. G, the GDP of whatever, whatever the GDP of the UK yeah. is two point seven billion with a sixth, fifth or sixth bigger. We're all we're always slightly bigger than France, which. Which give is good. Lot, give me a lot of pleasure. Um, with six biggest economy in the world, I think. But we've got, you know, a slow growing economy. It hasn't grown really for 10 years. People need to get off their asses and go and fix this stuff. Yeah. You know, I don't, I, we've got to be very careful not to sort of become a bit ranty. But, you know, roads, yeah, go, go for are, ranty. Ro go for ranty. roads are the archeries of the bloody country. And we, we, we really should get out there and, you know, where are the AA? They're not on Radio 4 talking about it. Where are the artists? There's no one moaning about it. We should be, as drivers, and not, not just people that enjoy driving sports cars, lorry drivers, all these guys driving into London, building stuff, fixing stuff, driving around the country. It's a pain in the bloody ass. And we could put men on the moon and invent Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. We can't fix holes in the road. I mean, it wouldn't be acceptable in Germany or France, would it? No. What's the reason, Chris? Uh, it's to do with the local, local Government Finance Act. Local governments in the UK can't borrow money. So local governments are dependent on only two sources of finance. Central Government Grant and Council Tax. And... Since 2000, the Local Government Finance Act came in 1988. I know a little bit about this. This is a little Chris Cooper explains. You do know a little bit about a lot, don't you? you I do. By the way, if, if you want to make a cup of tea or go and get a pan of shops, now would be a good time. Now to get me one. <laughs> uh, so since 1988, um, in the first 
15, almost 20 years of it, only two councils had a section 114. I know because my firm worked for the first one, London Borough of Hillingdon. London Borough of Hillingdon was the first council to declare bankruptcy in the modern era. In other words, they couldn't afford to pay their bills, couldn't borrow money, spent all the council tax, blah, blah, blah. So they were taken over by a guy called Councillor Ray Puddyfoot, who was a local accountant, and he completely transformed how local governments worked. Uh, he was the leader of the council for, I think, an unprecedented 22 years, got re-elected every four years. Uh, and he treated it like a business. Uh, he was local count. He lived that borough the whole time. He'd been Good. chief executive of the, um, what's, the, what's the heart hospital? Harewood, Harewood the Heart Trust, the Yagdi Makub one. So he knew how to run things. Hairfield. Yeah, Harefield. <laughs> he, he knew how to run things. And we did a bit of work with him, helping him sort out how to do adults, you know, how to run things properly. And when we, when we sort of done that, he said, you should do this for other local authorities. Mm -hmm. And we tried working for other local authorities, and it was a completely heartbreaking experience because just the quality of so many of the leadership and the executive, it was just very, very hard. So I think part of the difficulty is they can't borrow money. They're a bit stuck. Quality of the leadership. So... If hmm. you get section 114, so the most obvious race one, Birmingham. Birmingham City Council went yeah. bankrupt. Um, there is a structural weakness, is the answer, is the, is the boring answer to the question. There is a structural weakness in the financing of local office, not just in England, but in Wales and Scotland as well. It's so bad. It's so bad. Yesterday, I was in Basingstoke uh, visiting the extraordinary headquarters of the Automobile Association, Fanham House a beacon of motoring loveliness in southern England. And it's got one of those pay-by-phone app things, which didn't work. So there's a telephone number on the little board to phone the local council. And you phone, it's Basingstoke Borough Council. It's not Hampshire, it's the city council. And the first thing on the little sort of press one if was potholes. The first press one was potholes. It was just a whole number just for itself was potholes. Mm. Um, the other reason why they're so bad is it's... Because this, I mean, it's been so much bloody rain. Rain, yeah. Um, it's the hydraulic, the hydraulicizing effect of car. It's not frost. People think it's frost. It's not actually because we don't get frost these days, but we do get rain. So when a tire goes over a puddle, a pothole full of rain, the tire that sort of smack hydraulicizes and just craters. Anybody who went to Goodwood this weekend, if you drove from Lavant, the little beautiful little pretty village along the north side of the airfield. Just as you come out of Lavant, quite a narrow road, on the way going east towards the airfield, just on the inside, there's a massive pothole. I mean, literally, you could live in it. It's They're so like this deep. now, aren't they? Yeah, massive. It's about six or seven inches deep. Yeah. Um, quite wide. So, yeah, you'd rip a wheel off. So, yeah, I'm with... Other countries have, you know, problems as well, but there is something peculiar about and it may just be the the unique way in which local government is funded that potholes have just fallen over the edge of literally priorities so rant I mean, on we, neil we've all we've all we've all lost a, i think we've i've lost two wheels and no three wheels and three tires in the last year yeah um, and and obviously you know you can't you can't claim i wouldn't want to claim in a way i don't mind it every three or four years if you lose a wheel, you know, you don't, you don't want to ring up and start doing and trying to sue the council or any of that malarkey. We're all too busy, aren't we? But I mean, there must be hundreds of wheels getting done every six, every, every week yeah. in the UK. Are they used not to, they, they not used in to the London, out. sorry, carry on. They used to pay out if you made a claim 20 years ago, but now they just tell you to go away. Yeah. Sorry, uh, there's no potholes in the London of Borough and Kensington, Chelsea. I bet, well, I, bet I, <laughs> I bet you I could find one. I bet you I could find one. But yeah. what do you think? Um, honestly, I'm I'm not driving in the countryside enough. I, and they're on the M25, Ed. Well, yeah, but yeah. I'm 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 in I'm in London. I just I really haven't been driving outside of London. Yeah, much, but are you but... being serious? You, you you really reckon there are no potholes in London? Uh, yeah, but pretty much. Yeah, I don't. I, park. Our street. You drove to Goodwood. You drove to Goodwood at the weekend. Did you come across any potholes? Not really. By the way, I'm not saying it's not a problem. I'm just no, saying, know, yeah. you know, if if I if I'd smashed a pothole, I'd be here moaning about it. In in Portugal last week, I did notice these two lovely men 
uh, with a, a, a yellow van driving a, ahead of them, and they they were just um, scraping new asphalt into all the all the holes in the road as you drove down, and then someone was there behind them, fi fixing them all as they go. Chris is saying basically, you know, in in, in our great modern world. Um, where all of this stuff is demised to councils. Basically, there just isn't enough government money. And it's not, I mean, it's not just a question of, I actually, you know, my hospital was Hillingdon and it was run by, you know, by Hillingdon. And um, when you're really struggling, without making this too political, but when you're struggling to pay for sort of social services, get beds open in hospital and finish staffing rotors, I wonder where potholes sit in the list of priorities for your yeah. average heart. I mean, just stick some at the bottom. You know, you don't yeah. want a 24-hour wait in, in casualty at Hillingdon Hospital. So you go, well, you know, certain amount of money, this is the priority. Something more, and you also said rain, you know, wonder what's causing more rain. Who knows? The weather? Oh. Yeah. You can't always Did anyone about see Dubai? Money. Everyone Did knows anyone see always Dubai about yesterday? Money. Have you seen any of the pictures? Of Dubai, they had. Yeah, we like were talking about it just rain. before you joined the call. Yeah, it was unbelievable. I mean, unbelievable. Something's happening. <laughs> it's it's not just about money. It is. It's there's, not just about money. Yeah, you can see. You know, again, without being too political. About, you can... But you've said that you know they're they're fixed in what they can spend. Yeah. Nobody's giving them a grant to spend more. I mean, this is such an obvious um, sort of you know motoring policy, and but I'd probably a big vote winner. Cent central government said right. I mean, did you see Rishi Sunak yesterday? There was a nice photo of him looking at a pothole. He looked like Steve Davis. His head was so low on the tarmac, kind of getting his head around what this thing is. I mean, I think it may well have been the first one he'd ever seen. Yeah. If we what, what, if that, what if he's ever driven himself? Um, well, this is the whole point. Right. If we could, if we could, uh, if we get a message to him, say this is an absolute vote winner. Just central government fill the potholes. I just Home saw him. I saw him at Gloucester Rugby Club. Passing a rugby ball like you never passed one before. All embarrassing. Right. Um, so I'm going to step in here and tell you that because I, and few of you, few of you, my fellow podcasters will know this. I am a bit of a conspiracy theorist. I do believe there are people out there doing bad things for the wrong reasons. And I don't trust anyone. I walk, I walk down the road at five in the morning when the sun's come up looking behind me because I think someone's going to run me over. Um I, I still believe it's I still believe it's the persecution of the motorists. I think someone somewhere. Um, is making sure that the roads are in as poor condition as possible. I think I, I think it's I think the local government situation is a very convenient way of helping the anti-motoring lobby make sure that the roads are as shit as possible, so people don't want to get in their cars. It's a persecution of the motorists. You, there, the I, how much revenue is generated through road fund licenses, all sorts of taxation. It's a it is an, it's a national disgrace. Right. The roads that yeah. the state they're in. The local government situation, well, was brilliantly pilloried by yes minister back in 1981 or 82 that wonderful episode when it when it comes down to fallout shelters and they've got they've got the london borough of thames ditton i think they call it um is uh has, has, has declared itself as being um pro-russian and anti-nuclear and therefore they don't feel they need a fallout shelter but it's found that they do have one and they're all looking after themselves it's an amazing episode go and watch it but but again, it just shows the dislocation of local government. Should it become a national government issue? Of course it should. The idea that local boroughs should be responsible. Well, you know, those boundaries don't make any sense whatsoever. Anyhow, I've, I've this is this uh, the reason I've asked this uh, this topic or, or posed it is that someone from JCB got hold of me a few weeks ago and said, we've got a machine that can fix the pothole issue of the UK. They've developed a piece of wizardry, which I've got up here, which is called Pothole Pro. More of this later, okay? Here it is. It's um, you can't really see it there. There we go. There, there's Pothole Pro. This bad boy. Oh, oh, she's gorgeous. She's, I just she's want gorgeous. One of those. She rocks up. She's even got a tagline. She's got a tagline: "Cut, crop, clean with one machine." I no, mean, it's the first word. Cut. Stop oh. it. Um, uh, and it's uh, and I've spoken to their PR man. Sorry, PR man, head of comms, director of comms. And he's just said no one's buying it. So, of course, local authorities have no money. They don't want to buy the machine. But I, I still think there's a way through. How the much is it? They are waking up to this. So the, the brilliantly named Edmund King, I think, is about to start a bit of a pothole club. I think we need to have a good old-fashioned campaign yeah. in the newspapers. Yes. I think Sexton Cars needs to be part of it. I'm going to go and drive Pothole Pro 
in the next couple of weeks. Hopefully one of the addicts will come with me. I'd love you to all come along. Let's go and fill in some potholes because it is a national disgrace. And also, you know what? It's all very well. If you drive into a pothole in your bloody Ferrari FF and you bend the wheel, I'm sorry for you. But you'll probably get another car bought out and you'll go along in it or you'll find another wheel. I don't know how that works. But if you want a push bike and you're a nurse going to work and you drive into a pothole and you go over the handlebars, the consequences are different. This is the one issue I think that unites all road users in the UK. They're yes. just, it's not safe. It's not, and, and it's not. 61, 61, this episode is also the number of years of service. So Anthony Banford is now in as he oh. leads that business. He's just had his 60th, you know, they have great company that it is they have long service words they have one for him for his 60 years of service so he's now in six, year 61 amazing they can, can repair one in eight minutes yeah. eight minutes the stats for this thing are if, if there are a fleet of these things creeping about the uk the problem would be solved um and, and I, I do, even though i'm I, a conspiracy theorist in that area I, it is difficult to square that with the amount of money that is sloshing about in certain areas of the country. Uh, it's not a political podcast, but but I do think to myself, if you're the sixth richest economy, or if you were to boast to a foreigner, we're the sixth richest economy, and then drive them from Bristol to Easton in Gordano, they'd probably go, well, what are you spending it on then? Because you're not spending it on your roads, are you? It's yeah. uh, it's it's a it's a real and it's a, and it's a problem for those of us that love nice cars. We had this we had a similar issue about. 20 something years ago i'd say 22 23 years ago the roads again managed to fall into an area where no one was responsible or accountable actually chris cooper put me up on this hmm. it's when when roads fall into an area where everyone can, can put their hands up and go not my problem we have a problem now my late mother had bought or i'd bought for her a car from edward's local garage called um an alpina b10 3.3 touring it was a sexy car and it was all the money actually soon after that the lovets bought their first jet and um, I uh, and I can remember my mother phoning me at work and going, oh, dear, one of the wheels doesn't look right. And I went, OK, Alpina's then had, a, I think it was an 18-inch, that beautiful Alpina design wheel with the... Yeah, with the multi-spokes, beautiful. Uh, one of the great-looking wheels. And I saw it had a big dent in it. I thought it must be a bad wheel. Anyhow, I've still got all of the wheels from the B10 Touring. Oh. I've got... 17 bent rims that she did in three years on the same road driving to the golf course. I remember saying to her, could you just avoid the pothole? She said, not always convenient, dear. <laughs> they so were, I, in all fairness, those Alpina wheels, they were quite soft as well. Okay, well, there you and go. They, they were a bit bendy. So yeah. I think, so prepare yourself, prepare yourself soon for the campaign against potholes featuring collecting cars and other users. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, Chris, can you explain to me, not on this podcast, but uh, um, on a, on another uh, telephone call, as Birmingham Council is uh, bankrupt, does can we put a bid in for it? Can we buy Birmingham? What? How does that yeah. work? Okay, yeah. I think that's a smart move. Okay, yeah. we'll talk. Yeah, I'll. <laughs> so you, you you do inherit one or two liabilities when you do that. <laughs> no, that's part and of the negotiation. A load of potholes, <laughs> and not all of those can be solved. Every, How hard every, would it be? Every week we share an agenda, uh, and um, uh, it's normally quite straightforward. Lists what's going to be talked about, gives people a chance to prepare themselves. Um, one of our number is two things today. He's a year older, and also he doesn't like being kept in the it, out of the loop. And I just wrote down Edward's fact. Something happened to Edward on Sunday that I think generated the most interesting thing I've heard about motoring in the UK in years, which is ironic because I asked this question of our fellow Alex last week. I said, what's the most interesting thing, factoid, you found out about motor cars? And Edward was two days late to the party. Edward, tell us your story. So I went down to the members meeting on Sunday and I came back into London. I went and had a early dinner. Um, I had a beer. Oh. And then I did get in my car and I drove uh, home. And on the way home, I thought I might actually have another beer. So I, I, I pulled up and parked in Chelsea uh, and popped into a pub. And I thought, actually, no, I'm not going to. And I got straight back into my car and, and, and drove off. And then a police car appeared behind me and I was like, oh, shit. So I thought... I'll take a little left here and carried on up the road. 
bang it down two gears and then disappear. No, and then I thought, no, I was being very sensible. Bear in mind, the registration number on my car is 999-COP. So <laughs> I, he, they might, I might have antagonised them, and the car was bright green. So I thought, I'll, I'll take a little left here. If he follows me here, there's no way. That he wouldn't be taking this route. And then I thought, oh, these definitely after me. And then, so I took a, then went on to the main, I went on to uh, Old Brompton Road. And I thought, right, I'm going to go and fill my car up. And um, I went through the light, um, it, which was just turning orange. So he jumped it behind me and I was like, okay, here we go. And then I turned into the petrol station, got out of the car, uh, got under the fuel filler cap and started filling the car up. They pulled up behind me. Uh, and I didn't even look at them for the moment. I thought, I'm, I'm going to ignore they're even there. And then these two very very nice chaps got out of the car and uh, and walked up to me. And he goes, and they were they were they were very pleasant police officers. And they said, uh, you, like you know them. you know what we want to talk to you about, don't you? And I was like, you said yeah. I can't believe I bought it in lizard green. <laughs> 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 uh I was like I was like yes I do there's no front plate on my car oh and and they said yep you're right and he said unfortunately for you we've been chasing people around London all day um which is another topic I said about which is driving like a twat in in a, in a city you know not not cool it's not cool um but they've been they've been running around London chasing Lamborghinis and things around all day with no front number plates. And I said, look, I've got I've got no excuse. R r write me up. And so as the guy was taking my details down, uh, asking for postcode, etc., the other one said, uh, "I hope this hasn't happened to you before, because in a minute um, you'll have a Q plate and the car will be worth half." And I was like. I was like, what, what, what do you mean? I'll, I'll have a Q plate or the car will have a Q plate? No, no, no. Well, if you're a, if you're a repeat offender with that car, we'll, the DVLA, because do you know that you don't own that number plate? The DVLA own it and they, they rent it back to you. You might have paid a massive price yeah. for it. And I was like, okay, so what, what, are, what are you saying? He goes, well, if you're a repeat offender, we'll just stick a Q plate on the car. And you can never take that Q plate off that car again. So it'll be worth half, mate. Oh, oh my day. Bill Clifford, how good a factoid is that? That is. That's, that's good. That's king factoid. And so it's, it's... Neil mentioned, you've mentioned a few times recently about a Q plate. I don't want a Q plate. But I, I thought a Q plate was for a car that you can't register in a normal manner or is a like a homemade Catrum or something like that. But he just said... We'll stick a Q plate on it and it'll be worth half, mate. Yeah. Technically, Q plates are applied to cars where the age or and or identity is unclear. So in the years when we were growing up, when there were kit cars and, you know, Frankenstein's monsters of old Mark I escorts with and kit cars with Q plates, yes. that was why. It's sort of, there's a bit of a grey area on this. So people like the Eagle E types people have been quite worried about it because, you know, how much of the original E type is there? So um, they're quite right. So if they can't, if there's no front, the, the rationale is if there's no number plate, we cannot be sure of the identity and or the age of the car. Hmm. This will learn you. It just oh, yeah, the that, it that there are still some clever people that work in the civil service because someone has applied an obtuse piece of law to a serial piece of law breaking and they've come yeah. up with I think the cleverest solution I've heard in years. It is. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a very good it, it certainly it made you think immediately. And you know, if if people knew that was the consequence, they would consider their actions. Did did he ask did, you did why you did money it? Money as a weapon against Edward. He, he well the stupid he he didn't ask me why I did it, but I do have the plate in the front and and I I have it has been raised before. And and I'm not. I think some some cars do aesthetically look quite good without a plate on the front. How, however, I just don't want to drill holes in the front of the car. Um, and the stupid thing is, I've been sent the a, a full size sticker number plate yeah, to, yeah, fit sticker. to the fit to fit to the front of the car, which he said, well, that's not legal. And the other one said, no, 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 it is. If you've got a full size sticker, it is, it is legal. And and it's in my glove box. And the only reason I haven't fitted it is because of my OCD. 
And I, I'm worried there's going to be lots of air bubbles under it. So I was waiting to go to someone like Topaz Slightly, who put a yeah. bit of their spray on it and make it, yeah, get <laughs> make topaz, it perfect. Topaz. Yeah. So I got Topaz to do mine, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I mine, would, mine wouldn't be straight. Yeah, I think likewise. It's, I think it's, it's, it's really clever. I don't... I understand all sorts of weird car behaviours where people are naughty and flout the law, and none, none of us, none of us could claim that we don't break a law every single day. So there's no piousness here. But the front plate one, I don't get. I just don't get. I don't see why you should be able. Why should you be allowed to hide yourself from the speed cameras that can get the rest of us? I just think it's absolutely ridiculous. And if you haven't got a front number plate on the car, then frankly, you can wear it. I, I just don't. And also, they don't look better without a front number plate. They look like a bloody face without a nose. In America, I wouldn't have raised this subject. So I thought I was going to get a telling off from you. Pipe down. <laughs> no, no, no. We, we, why, why should? Why should? Why should you? I mean, the whole the, in this country, speed cameras a bit of a joke. Anyway, motorcyclists should they have their their bloody should you, on your should, should your chin bar have your license plate number on it because they're completely immune to speed cameras as well. Well, you'll be but very it, happy to hear, Chris. I didn't get away with it, and I will be receiving a hundred pound fine through the post in the next eight weeks. He said. Um, well, my new registration is Q999COP. <laughs> I can't wait to see a Chiron driving around Hyde Park Corner, stop him and go, it's on a Q plate, mate. What's in it? Jag V12. What has <laughs> you put in it? I mean, a, a, a Q <laughs> plate. Kit car, is it? A, no, Q, a Q plate makes bit, but... any, any car, any car, the coolest car in the world, put a Q plate on it, it's not cool anymore. It's, yeah, the, yeah. it's the bottom of the food chain on registration plates. It's just... It's terrible, Q plate. It's, it's when did you last thing. spot a Q plate? I, I I don't think I've oh. think I've seen one. Uh, I'm not uh, almost almost ever. I would have I would have seen one on a kit car or something. You know like. where I you know where I saw one on one of the cars. I'm, I'm pretty sure that Gordon Murray built himself one of those tiny little Duttons. Do you remember the Dutton? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And he, he he built it with Brabham parts, and it's got a Lotus twin cam, this amazing thing that he built, and I think it's 78, 79. That had a Q plate on it. Yeah. As did and, kit cars had Q plates. They did. And there were loads around when we were younger, weren't they? People kick the kit car scene was a bit bigger. Here, yeah. here, here's a weird tangential point. Q is not a letter that was used on conventional number plates, hence the reason why it could be deployed for this reason. If something is denied us we normally think it's cool because it's rare so that letter would be rare but the moment but that letter was always associated with shit boxes wasn't it so <laughs> it, sh it should be a really you, sh you should everyone should crave a queue on their own plate it should be more valuable but it was rubbish no but it's like that it's the lamborghini Countach, isn't it with a rover v8 and you know like a shit steering yeah. wheel it's yeah. just associated with a dodgy car isn't it yeah the mr2 <laughs> that got turned into a 355 <laughs> yeah exactly oh god yeah. yeah we had one of those on the tv show a too. chisel a chisel 356 oh speed. come on <laughs> <laughs> no a chisel speedster is not too bad that reminds oh, me oh i'm not oh. sure i disagree it reminds you me you've got several million quid for a real one I, what Tell you what, there you go. Subject for next week: replicas and and uh, and those things. Are they worthwhile? Yeah. Good not point. every not everyone can afford a real C type. No, but it's just a Q plate. As long as it hasn't got a Q plate, I don't mind it. Yeah. If it's got a Q plate, can you pay to put a private plate on it? Or must no, it? no, no, no. Once it's there, it's that's there. the point. Unless you can prove there's been, I and mean, that's why it's a bit of fuck. Because actually, they shouldn't have disappeared technically, because no. the law hasn't changed. Yeah, let's, let, let's leave done. that one there, Mr. Cooper, shall we? There we go. Very good. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, Chris Cooper explains no more. <laughs> let's, um, let's talk about BMW's surprising electric car results from last week. Um, so, um, Mr. Musk has just laid off 10% of his workforce. That's not good for anyone because we don't want people losing their jobs. But BMW, those sneaky little mincheners, have suddenly started doing rather well with their electric car range, apparently outstripping uh, VW Group and Mercedes quite comfortably. Chris Cooper, why do you think this is? So the numbers are interesting. I'm glad you asked me this question. Um, so BMW in Q1, so January, February, March 2024, um, increased like for quarter for quarter, like for like this year to last year. It's BEV, battery electric vehicles, as opposed to BEV, by 29%, 28%, 29%. 
Um, VW, Mercedes, and other popular premium brands, and Tesla, all went down. Uh, why did BMW... And just com for comparison, so and BMW also celebrated this by saying, we've sold our one millionth, Rodney, battery electric vehicle ever. Mm. Tesla have sold about 5.8 million EVs ever. So they're sort of... BMW is still catching up. My theory, because the overall level of battery electric vehicle sales globally has slowed. The UK is now the only country um, that has both potholes and no domestic tax incentives for retail electric vehicle sales. There are company car incentives, but no. Them. So my explanation as to why in a marketplace which has slowed globally for EVs, every other manufacturer's figures... What's BMW done differently? Um, my guess is there is a couple of things. One is they've actually got some quite nice cars. The i4 is doing yeah. really well. Yeah, and I think the i4 looks quite nice, yeah. quite well priced. Uh, the Tesla model range is getting a bit old. I know it's now sexy because it's got a Model S, a 3, an X, and a Y. But that is about the only level of attractiveness. Once you look, they're, they're a bit... I, I've always said this, when... Once other real car manufacturers start building EVs, you'll get an EV with a Jaguar or a BMW effectively thrown in for free. So I think Tesla is now finding that challenge of other people have got battery electric vehicle technology, but it's in something called a BMW or Mercedes, or whatever. BMW done spectacularly better. Everybody. And I suspect it's a combination of they've really put a leg on in incentives to the dealers. Edward, you'll know a bit more, tell us a bit more about this. Um, and other model ranges, Mercedes model, they've some of their AVs are just not quite there yet. So, yeah, I think it's a mm. number of relative factors which says, well done, BMW, for bucking the trend of the otherwise slow marketplace. And the i4, if I had to buy an EV right now, I'd probably buy an i4. I think, um, it, it, I went to saw a friend last year, so yesterday in Cornwall, uh, I fancied a bit of Cornish coast, and my friend, oh, nice. Tony, my friend Tony, who uh, Chris has met um and he he's um he's he's a bit of an oracle on stuff too. He, he knows lots about his cars he was one of the early adopters of an an eqc by mercedes which him and his wife quite rightly said was was pretty much useless they live um just south of newquay and they couldn't get to exeter and back in it on a, on a warm day so it really was just a chocolate fire guard of a car and once the lease ran out They've now got, I'm looking it up. Um, this is interesting. I don't really know. I used to know every car on the road. The BMW model range, <laughs> this confirms how much choice they've got. I can't really spot them all. There's so many different layers of them. Yes, there they've is. Got yeah. an iDrive, an iX xDrive 40, I think, from what I saw yesterday is what they've replaced it with. Similar sort of money. They just said it's a totally different quality of product. You know, Mercedes, the Mercedes car is a conventional ICE-based car that's been converted to electric, which, which yeah, we badly. all an ultimate disaster. It weighed the EQC weighed two point seven tons because it was because it was it had all the downsides of the IC architecture with some batteries thrown at it. The, the BMW weighs a lot less. It's just a superior product in every single mm. way. What's they don't that? have they don't have lots of cars, do they? I mean, it's incredible. <laughs> but, so, but but a lot of a lot a lot of the people, the the commentators that judged these results last week put it down to, to the extraordinary offerings from BMW that there's so much choice that if you walk into a BMW showroom, there's probably an electric car for you, whatever that means. Yeah. Um, you so should be in marketing. The, the other thing that I thought was extraordinary was the, the ultimate electric car genius for me is Mate Rimac, who makes the supercars. He congratulated publicly BMW on their results because of, because of the, the broadness of their range, despite the fact that he works for Porsche, which I which is a love a, a very confusing statement. But um I do I do think BMW is having a really good crack at it. And I, yeah. I was being followed by the big IX SUV yesterday, which is that's a complicated looking machine. Yeah. But when it's up your chuff with its big bloody teeth like that and its eyes like this, it's an imposing machine. It really is. Um Neil Clifford, you hate electric cars. Does this sadden you or do you think BMW are doing a good job? I think they're doing a great job. You read, you read those results. They're obviously right on their game. Um, they're selling more of everything. It's, the, it's, the, it's a record year for BMW in terms of volumes completely. So not just electric, everything. And I suppose they've done 
they're great engineers they're nice cars to drive aren't they the the um the systems and 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 the dash and all of that integration works lovely where the mercedes thing is always a bit of a struggle and you don't understand that silly nipple thing and i don't like all of the 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 um electronics in term inside the mercedes i think bmw just great engineers it's a super good brand isn't it if you want to if you've got a bit more money and you don't want to be in that sort of middle land of tesla and vw and mg and chinese things you've never really heard of but they're a bit cheaper and they're probably okay but god knows if you've got a bit more money it's sort of a rolex of of cars isn't it it's a status symbol it's a cool brand it shows you're being successful mm. it shows you're going somewhere you're not like you know you're you're a little more elevated maybe than your neighbor you know it's a it's a brand thing as much isn't it i think yeah. who, who, who's, who has seen who has seen the xm on the road i've i've seen one yeah yeah wow i mean i i there's not one atom in me that could could, could tell you it was attractive but bloody hell, it's an impact machine, isn't it? It is. What, was, it, what, was it black with the red bits around the side? What yeah. was it? It was, was it? And it had the and it, it was it was in the gloaming and the bloody grill was lit up. It looked was like it? like it had just driven in from the future. Yeah, I, I've got to say, I actually I, I think some there's some some really cool design cues in that car, but the black one with the red strips around the window, I think I took you took sent a photo to you when I was in New York of that car. That's a weird looking design. <laughs> I mean, you, you said something recently, Chris, which I, you know, I didn't realize because obviously I'm not in your world in terms of knowing this stuff, but it resonated when you said the BMW people just care about driving a bit more. And you can tell, can't you? When you drive a BMW, it's more pleasurable than the other stuff. Yeah. It does feel different. Sorry. The, the, X, the XM is a uh, hybrid, isn't it? It's, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is a hybrid. Sorry, manage, 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 you've been trying to say something. Carry on. No, no, no. It's just um, for BMW. I think um, when I thought about this, and uh, they actually had an amazing solution almost a decade ago, which was the i3. And yeah. if you think about the i3, it was just so unconventional, so purpose built. And I know, I mean, I know literally a dozen people who bought it, you know, who, who bought one of those over the last decade, every single one has sung its praises. Yeah, you know, they, it's a very they cool car. Everything car. about it, from the way the doors open, to its range, to its comfort, to its build quality. And I think what's quite cool about what you're all saying is we're living in a world of massive financial engineering. I get it. And it makes you incredibly rich if you can shift a pe pebble now. But what's really great about the story is they make something wonderful yeah and it's not just a wonderful back to basics thing they make great cars and they're able through their financial products to get these great cars to people the only car again remember i i considered for ages in terms of hybrid the only thing i considered was the um five series touring to drive around remember how many times i said you know da, 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 and we talked about the i4 I mean, I think it was almost a year ago. As literally, it's a, it, it's just such a great looking car. Yeah, it's good. you know, you just mm. buy it. It's definitely mm. the best looking electric car out there. The, the um, um, have you seen the advert? There's an US market BMW i5 advert with Christopher Walken. Yes. Where yeah. The gag in the advert is the people he's driving from a restaurant to somewhere, and everybody he meets that day does the Christopher Walken, you know, yeah. impersonation. You know, Full you know. Fighting. What this fighting. needs is more cowbell, that, that impersonation. And the, the point of the advert is there's only one Christopher Walken and there's only one BMW. Hmm. And it, ultimate driving machine. I thought, that's bloody right. Yeah. Mm. Well done then. The, the, what, just flicking through their um, models here, the, the, this is what I think they've done right. That, that, that's, a, that's an X2. Do you yeah, notice you anything to. different between the two of them? No. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. They've designed a BMW because of what BMW owners like, and the electric version looks exactly like the combustion engine version, and that's what people want. They go into a showroom, they see the car they want to buy, and it happens to be electric, and they're happy with that. 
Mm. Um, you go into a Mercedes a showroom, you look at an E63 AMG wagon, it looks fucking brilliant. And then you look at some <laughs> EQS bollocks and you think, why does that look like that? I don't want to buy it. It looks shit. Um, and yeah. I, 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 really, I really believe that. We, we talked yeah. about, I, I, I totally get the fact with an electric car, you don't need to design it like a conventional car. But BMW have had BMW have had customers for years and years who just like the look of the kidney grills. They like yeah. the look of the five series touring. And when they want to yeah. go and buy an electric version, it needs to look exactly like the 530 diesel they've owned for the last 20 years. Yeah. And that, that so they're, they're, it's far easier for them to make that choice. They're not consciously buying an electric car to a certain degree. Yes. They're just buying the replacement to their five series touring. Very Words true. of wisdom. Yeah, it's true. Um, they, but they better get used to some bigger kidneys because they're running out of space for them kidneys. <laughs> they are. Uh, so the, um, the, the the new seven series is just going to be a kidney grill. It's incredible. There's a brilliant post on Instagram where someone's taken some kidneys off an E twenty one three series and put them onto a new car, and then taken the new ones and put them on the three series. And they don't. They, it looks like it looks like a three year old wearing its mother's bra. Yeah. <laughs> So let me um, let me now pass us on to we've never done this. What's your best run out of fuel story? I mean, let's just start off. The time is seven forty nine a.m. Neil Clifford, you've got until half past eight. <laughs> the, the, the funny thing is, I don't really run out of fuel very often, actually. Because I, I, I was thinking, oh, I must have loads of stories of running out. And, of course, I sort of do a little bit and ring the wife and I'm five miles up the road in a Land Rover and she brings the can. And But very rarely do I... I'm normally... My story that I've got, if anything, is I used to run out of money. Yeah. And even when I had my first posh job with my company car, because I was at a level as a grade five, I didn't get a petrol card. So I had the car, but I didn't have the money to put the petrol in it. So when I used to go to work, I used to have to drive behind my mate, um, Paul, because he was a higher level than me and he had a petrol card. Because I had about seven MB, you remember the MBNA credit card? Yes. Yeah. I had I had three of those bad yeah, boys. I had a silver one, a gold one, a premier yeah. one, all with 39.99% APR, which I didn't really understand at that point. It's just you, know, <laughs> you owed seven grand and every month 5% come out of your bank account. And then you went to your went to your cash point the day you got paid and you didn't have any money left because MB and A had taken all the money. Um, <laughs> that was so This I, is a captain of industry speaking. <laughs> No, but you know, we all had the MBNA thing. Yeah. We, you know, it was normal, right? You could, you, phone, you could phone up and they'd say, What's your name? You'd go, Johnny Briggs. They'd go, Your card's in the post. Yeah. There were no checks. They and, didn't, then, and every no month compliance. they'd write to you and say, We can increase your credit limit from £2,000 to £4,000. And you're only, you're only, I don't know, you owe three grand and you'll get a Four hundred pounds interest bill every bloody man. They were making billions. They were. I'm, I'm trying to remember how all that ended. Well, you could then claim. When, yeah, when you appeared with many yeah. potholes. Yeah, yeah, when banks yeah. decided that they were in the marketing money business, and it turned out that marketing money was quite easy. <laughs> <laughs> Giving my, it away very. My, easy. my biggest challenge was, frankly, for the first ten years of having a car, was I didn't have the money really to put the petrol in the car. So I had to drive behind my mate most of the time because he had a, yeah. and then he would get a bollock in because his, his account, his petrol account was twice everyone else's because he was filling my car up at the same time. <laughs> uh, Edward Lovett's got a fun Edward's got a great answer to this, which he wrote in our, in our WhatsApp group. Can you repeat <laughs> that please Edward? I think I wrote, I'm too organized. I've never run out of fuel. What type of person runs out of fuel? <laughs> Which well, I, know, I, 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 I wish I had a romantic story to say my Bentley gauge was sort of not reading yeah. correctly and I not got stuck on the M25. The, the, the only time I could have done with some fuel and didn't have it was 
20 years ago, driving through France when there had been some massive storms and we were running very low on fuel. And as I said, I always like to, I know where I'm going to pull over and get my fuel. So it's a particular service station. And we pulled into that service station and the storms had taken out the electric. There's no electricity there. Oh, so yes, the I've heard that. Work. Uh, so we had to wait for eight hours at the petrol station until they got electricity back so we could get some fuel. Well, yeah, I've had that. Yeah. Manage, manage as someone who fills up once every quarter, this can't really be a problem for you. <laughs> That's the only time I've ever come close is in Tobago, actually, in one of these uh, wonderful Daihatsu Terriers. As we um, normally, they're terrific cars. You just literally, you, you get this thing completely brimming when you get out of the airport. And it, it normally goes the full two weeks. And I remember there was this, my, my son used to volunteer at um, a place called the Corbin Wildlife Reserve, where they, you know, they look after birds and lizards and snakes. And I used to drive him there every day. And I remember, I think we were on day 13 out of day 14. And out of courtesy, we would always fill the car up. I realized it was below empty. And I must admit, I was doing a bit of Formula One lifting and coasting up and down the hills of Tobago. And we literally made it to the um, fuel station in a great place called Plymouth. And the guy just, he just looked at it and he went, you're running on fumes. You're running on fumes. Yeah. <laughs> and it was 30 quids worth of petrol later. We were at F plus, so never, never absolutely run out, I'm afraid. I mean, this was your mind topic, mind. Christopher. Did you run out of fuel this week? Yeah, by any chance. Oh, no, actually, it was probably one week I didn't. But I have, <laughs> I mean, I've run out of fuel so many times, I can't really, I can't recall them all. And I could, and if, I, and if someone reminded me of seeing by the side of the road, I'd go, oh, I'd forgotten that one. So it's happened many, many times. I think a couple stand out. Yep. Um, I can remember having a white E63 AMG, the normally aspirated one, uh, last shape, and my daughter would have been about four. And it, I used to run out so regularly in that thing because I, I I hate fuel, fuel forecourts. I've, I'm so disorganised. I don't really care. And I'll, I'll if it gets to naught, I'll keep going. I, I, I still think... I like to know whether naught means naught as well. So, I mean, there's yeah. that whole jeopardy. <laughs> Turns out, in many German cars... It does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, sent, I sent my then four and a half year old daughter um, uh, with with the fuel can that I always carried in the car because I knew it was going to happen to the forecourt to get some petrol. She was so used to doing it, but I got massive. I got a massive ticking off because she shouldn't have been doing it. But Xanthi is brilliant at that, so she should have been. Uh, she should have been doing it anyway. I once I once ran out as I rolled onto a forecourt in a Ferrari FF. <laughs> causing absolute mayhem because there's a fuel that fuel system is pressurized and if you if you break that seal or something goes wrong it causes utter mayhem so the whole dashboard lit up and it had to go back to edward's family and they sent me a bill for about a million pounds so that was my fault um but i, I can remember some really funny ones because there there are instances where as a human being you're suddenly put into a strange situation of vulnerability uh, and quite often you can be in a very fast car yes. and it elicits incredible human reactions. I think my favourite one of all, if you break down in a 2CB and you've got no fuel, the chances are people will be lovely to you. They'll just think there's a hippie or there's a person that likes old cars. But if you if in 2003 you break down in a 996 Turbo going up the steep uphill bit on the M5, is it so on the M4 as you get towards Bristol, there's that steep uphill bit as you get to the Armsbury Interchange. So I'm going along there and my my 911 turbo just cuts out, it just cuts out. And I remember what the story was. Do you remember those Porsche nerds out there? The four-wheel drive 996s and 997s actually had a saddle tank in the front, which would go over where the front differential was for the four-wheel drive system. But the, the the sender for the fuel gauge was on one side of it. So if you if you if you filled the car up fully, it the the bot, both bottom bits were were connected were connected. You were full up. But what could happen was you could let the thing empty. The sender would drop down. If you only then put in half a tank, the sender wouldn't go back up with it. So if you didn't fill it up more than half, it would stay on empty. And then you were playing Jeopardy. You had to remember how much fuel was in it. And I got it wrong. So I'm going up the hill and it just cuts. I was going to play golf with a friend. 
and I pulled over on the left and I got out and it took no more. I phoned wife, friends to help me out. It took no more than a minute before the first Wanka! shout from the cargo. <laughs> and I got Porsche. Wanka! Then I got another wanker. And I got a, I got a lot of high quality abuse, Nazi stuff, um, all the other stuff, a little bit of racism as well. It was all, you know, standard stuff, really, on the M4 on a Saturday morning. But the, for me, the coup de grace was a motorcyclist that came past. And he tried to give the international symbol for wankerdom, because with a full face helmet on, you can't shout wanker. But he was going on a fair old clip on a Suzuki Bandit. So he stuck his left arm out and went like this and gave me the international symbol for a wanker. But he's going so fast. His own arm hit him in the face, and then he <laughs> fell off his motorcycle about a hundred yards up the road. No. Yes, he did, and I didn't. Uh -huh. I had a bit. I had a bit of time on my hands. Um, <laughs> so I, went, I went along to see how he was, um, and once I'd seen he was okay, I just looked at him, left him on the ground moaning, and walked back to my car. Uh -huh. so, but I, I do, um, yeah, I, I do run out of fuel quite a lot. I've got another, another good one. I can remember. Uh, my very dear friend Andrew Frankel borrowed my long loan Clio V6 from me. It was the second second phase one. It was black, had the full oh the special car, interior. yeah. It was yeah. a really special car, and he borrowed it. And I got a I got a I got a message. In fact, it was well past midnight, small hours of the morning, saying, "What well, you never told me that the fuel gauge in this thing read oddly." <laughs> and I, I was like, "Well." Oh, I've never really tried it. He goes, well, it, the, the computer says it's got 25 miles left and it's just run out on the M4. And I went, <laughs> so I said, time and percentage. So you've trusted a Renault fuel gauge, Renault fuel gauge in a car that's been converted to have its engine at the back. It <laughs> might be that I wouldn't trust it. Anyway, you're not being helpful or something. And then, <laughs> and then, and then we, we laughed about it in the pub. So I've, I've run out in a Peugeot 607 going to... London, I remember that, a diesel one. It, it said that, that again said it had 10 miles left and it didn't. I remember running to Heston Services and the person in front of me bought the last fuel can, at which point I was thinking this is a problem. So then I got into a bidding war. He paid a tenner for the fuel can. I had to give him 30 quid to buy the fuel can from him. <laughs> no. so, yeah, I, I, could write, I could write a book on these things. I always carry a fuel can in any old car. Yeah, 70% of the time I'd remember fire extinguisher obviously these two things don't really go together petrol can full of petrol and a fire extinguisher if Spain. i've got a car older than i don't know the 80s i'll try and have those two things in the car either spain or france this would have been a good factoid last week one of them you can't carry fuel in the car with you yeah like, during when they had the when we had the fuel protest in 2000 2000 yeah yeah, that's when BMW launched the E46 M3. I remember driving through France and Spain with Steve Sutcliffe, worried that we wouldn't get any fuel. So we put 20 little green cans of fuel on the back shelf. When we got to Spanish customs, they said, come here, please. Get all of that fuel out of the car now. Don't be so silly. You can't do that in Spain. Right. Yeah. Poor old Chris Cooper has been gagging to say something there. So the, one of the reasons we've touched on this before, you're not OCD, Chris. In, remotely in the way that I am, because OCD is about anxiety. Yeah. And nowhere is anxiety felt more than, will I run out of petrol? Yeah. So, what's, the worst, what's the worst thing could happen? Um, it's it's the anxiety of the, the unknown. That's what, that's what anxiety is. Anxiety isn't rational. So, um, you know, we talk about this a lot on our little WhatsApp chat. What is nicer than seeing a Full fuel gauge in a car. Yeah, what sense of well-being. Full not bank that. account, mate. Much happier yeah, with that. You know, but this is you know this is this is a car podcast, not sort of you know. But full fuel tanks are lovely. They sort of they they're the epitome of well-being. So you sort of I sort of fill up. There's a big difference between motoring and you know because I do stuff on boats and marine stuff. Um, when you're in a boat, you fill up when you can not when you need to, because you never know when you're going to not find fuel, blah, blah, blah. And I'm kind of the same in the car. I like filling up when I can. So I know whatever the eventuality, there's 500 miles or 350 miles of range, what it is. So I'm mm. in the Marine world. Well, I, I used to do lots of yacht racing years and years ago. I might have mentioned before. And I did my, got halfway through my yacht master training. And there was a bit in the yacht master training where they said, 
Okay, what do you do if you get caught on a lee shore? In other words, bad weather, the wind's blowing you onto the shore. You get caught on a lee shore. You've got problems with propulsion and steering. What do you do? And the training course basically says, never find yourself caught on a lee shore with problems with propulsion <laughs> and steering. You're stuck. A mate of mine has just done his PPL. And he said, yeah, there's something in PPL like that. He said, if you have an engine failure and you're flying at night, wait until you get to 500 feet and then you put your landing lights on to try and find a field. And he said, if you don't like what you see, just turn the lights off again. Yeah. That's all you can do. <laughs> I'm a bit like that with sort of not wanting to run out of fuel. Although, yeah, I've got two, two quick stories. Um, Frank Beeler ran out of petrol in the first stint of the 2003 Le Mans race. It was the only year Audi didn't enter because Bentley kind of took the lead. The Bentley won that year. And Perry McCarthy, original Stig, was in the car. And I raced with him in 2004 in Porsche Carrera Cup. And we were at Super Cup at um, the race at Silverstone. Only time the race programs had my name in it and Michael Schumacher's. And Perry was there. And he's telling the story. He said, because he could have won that race. And they ran out. And Frank was trying to overtake some pain odds into the pits and thought, I can't back off. But the pain oils accelerated that Porsche occurs faster. So he had to go past the pit, had to go past the petrol station. That was I it. Was there. That I was there, yeah. Um, and that was the race in which 2004 Super Cup, I put Nelson PK Jr. in the gravel trap at the old Abbey chicane. Because you but, run out of fuel? No, a bit of hip and shoulder. I just didn't like him. We had a driver What's that got to do with running out of fuel? My other running out of fuel story <laughs> does involve a Ferrari FF. Ah, yes. Whose was that? Uh, in fact, it's my only running out of fuel story, not quite running out of fuel story. And it belonged to a very generous friend who might already have referred to his own FF in this podcast. Ah. So he lent it to me, did Mr. Harris. I didn't tell him I was going to take it to Cornwall. He discovered I'd taken it to Cornwall when I called him from a petrol station on the A30 in some distress because we were driving out of St. Moors and I thought, and it was quite low in fuel, I thought, well, it's a nice car. You can only put Shell or SO 99 octane fuel in this car. Yeah. I thought, I know there's one on the A30. There was a BP one and some Texaco ones. No, that's not, that's not good enough. That's not good enough for Monkey's car. And the range was 25, 26 miles. And I thought, well, I know there's an SO one just up beyond Bodmin. I'll stop there. And going down the hill, it just, all this, the whole dashboard went berserk with lights and shit and stuff. And call the dealer, call the oh, owner, call I Matthew. That yesterday. In a, Ferrari, in a Ferrari, call a dealer is a different different message altogether, mate. It, it's it a, is. Call, so I got you, into call, you get call your dealer or call your service centre. There you go. <laughs> yep, that one. Yesterday. That's the one. Go to dealer. So I got into this SO service station thinking, I'm mortifying and bad. I've broken Monkey's car. So I called Matthew and said, what do I do? He said, Monkey doesn't know. Don't tell him. What do I do? He said, you're going to have to call the AA, the Ferrari assistants. Um, they're just going to laugh at you. So I put some fuel in it. And I did, every Ferrari owner knows this, put some fuel in it, turn it off, go and have a cup of tea, come back, turn it on again. Hey, presto. Yeah. It worked. Thank but you. not without me having told everybody because I was so embarrassed. But, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I have done I it had Even though I'm OCD, I've done it once. I had a failed four-wheel drive system and non-responding diff on an FF yesterday. And you just pull up, turn it off, turn it on again. I mean, it's like a three-year degree in IT, isn't it? Yeah. Turn it off, <laughs> turn it on again. <laughs> and it works. <laughs> you, know, you know, we used to have um, an NHS IT helpline. Uh, sort of Hillingdon, Mount Vernon, and literally that was, you'd wait two hours to speak to an IT person, and that was always the answer. <laughs> I mean, it's, it was brilliant. It's it sort of is the answer, mainly, isn't it? Right. Do you know why I put Nelson PK Jr. in the gravel trap at the Abbey Chicane? Because you were, didn't like him, you said. There were four There were four British drivers, Barry Horn, me, a couple of other ones, and on the Friday of the race meeting, Herbie Blash who kind of ran the super cup and Nelson Piquet was in the celebrity car. He was doing British F3 at that time. So we got the five of us into the race center. And obviously, cause his dad used to race with Brabham. So Nelson Piquet Jr. was 18 at the time, arrived with two quite young ladies, one on each knee. 
And we sat down in these chairs and Herbie said, Nelson, how are you? Really nice to see you. I saw your mother earlier. She's lovely. How's your dad? Please send him my love. Anything we can do for you this weekend, just let us know. We're here for you, Nelson. Your family. And then he turned to the rest of us, Barry Horn, me and one other bloke, I can't remember, and said, right, everyone hates you. You're all <clears throat> Cambridge University netball teams. If you step out of line, if you do anything wrong, you'll never race again. If you put it in the barrier, no one cares. We're not here for you. You're all <clears throat> So I thought, that's not very nice. So on the first lap, the melee of the first lap of a Super Cup race, I found myself alongside Nelson Piquet Jr. going into the Avi Chicane. And I don't know what happened, but suddenly the next thing I knew was he was in the gravel. We're not editing this yes. out, by the way. <laughs> yes. Not, what's, what's the statute of limitations on a disciplinary at the at Motorsport UK? Um, I, I think I'm past that. And I think he's got he had bigger <laughs> problems with causing accidents than I did. Yeah. <laughs> Herbie, yeah. Herbie. Well said. Right. Two Herbie has moved on. Herbie. Two Herbie car moved on. It's summer of 1987, and you live in Miami, and life is good. You're running a successful business importing flour from South America. Business is so good that money is not a concern, however, space is. You only have room for two cars. One must be able to carry three of your business associates and the relevant equipment needed in the flour selling business. The other car must be something rare, something exotic, something that won't be outshined by anything when you park in front of the nightclub. Both cars should have a correct image for a successful flower importer and distributor. Um, I'm going to start with Edward Lovett, please. I fucking knew that was going to happen. I disregarded 1987. Ah, OK, we'll come back to but, it. No, but, 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 but I'm going to give you my answer anyway, because it's it's the it's the right answer. And I, I'm sure they did some version of it. Well, I have to do it because you might because one of them is from that era and I don't want anyone taking uh, it. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Okay. So my, my first choice, the car to transport your friends of the business around was going to be a relatively modern Maybach 67 Londolet, um that they did, if, if <laughs> which I, I think DJ Khaled might have one. Too um, too but too it's, too. yeah, it's it's not, um, they didn't build that in 1987. So I, I'll come back with something. But the sports car is the Gianni Agnelli Testarossa Spider. The silver car. The silver car. With the blue leather. Yeah. Okay. okay, there you go. I think you got that wrong. That's the goodies car, not the baddies car. I'm with you. Okay. <laughs> uh, Chris Cooper, you can go next. So, uh, it's got to be, if it's 1987, it's got to be, and it's in America, it's got to be the Vector W2. Okay. Yeah. Mm, yes. Yeah. We yep. can't see that. I'll send you oh, it's a bit dark. The Vector yeah. W2, which had yeah. a million horsepower. Or it could be that um, sledgehammer Corvette that did two. Whoa, 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 whoa. You allow one. They're yeah. baddies. The, the other one, it's very important. So Alan Kuhn, who uh, suggested this, very well written. One must be able to carry three of your business associates. What's the best car for carrying three people? In McLaren America? F1. It's a pickup truck. <laughs> it's a pickup truck. <laughs> It's got to be, and the relevant equipment needed in the flower selling and distribution business. There's a lot of equipment required in there. Probably some scales to make sure that the flower but, is sorry, in the right proportion. If we're going to the, into the, if we're, if we're drilling into the description. It's three plus the driver, so that's four. No, it that's doesn't four. say that. It doesn't say that. That's why three, Alan's written it so well. Needs to carry three of your business associates. Yeah, so there's yeah. three of them and one of you. Doesn't say that. Well, who's driving the car then? The well, three you business might. associates. So you're carrying them, therefore you're driving mm -hmm. them. One must be able to carry three of your business associates and the relevant equipment. It doesn't say three of your business associates <laughs> and you. <laughs> Alan's written this very carefully. It's Don't a pickup quick. truck. So you'd have yeah. you'd have a Ford F-350 done in that big monster truck style <laughs> A bit like, you know, in the <laughs> film Clear in Present Danger, no, that, it's Roadhouse. Um, what about the one in Roadhouse at the end? Yeah. So you'd have a big Ford F-350, one with the big rear arches yeah. and the sort of the double tyre rear axle. 
Yeah. Big Julie. A Julie. A Julie. Yeah. You know. Oh, yes. Very cool. Okay, Neil Clifford. Right, you're all so off the bloody mark. It's embarrassing. <laughs> the obviously he needs to wash some of this flour, so he needs to buy what are not only the most expensive but the coolest cars of eighty seven. This guy's a bit of a dude. He may well be a flour importer, but he's got taste. So he's got he bought the two coolest cars that came out in eighty seven. They are the BMW M five E twenty eight, which he debadges. Yeah. It's got a big boot, as Chris will know. They've got a massive boot. I do think he's carrying four people. I think that three-person thing is a little bit pedantic. But I'm being pedantic. Okay, I'll give you that. But but nevertheless, you're 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 technically right. I'm sure. But I think it needs four people, even five, because you might want to have your girlfriend in the middle at the back or something. But then more importantly, he's going to Germany. They've just released the nine five nine. He could go F forty, but um 959 just come out in 87 he's got the first one he's actually got the s with the single mirror and he's gone guards red white wheels single mirror 550 brake not 450 and he still owns it it's worth three million quid now so he's it was an investment yeah he'll need it when he gets out yeah yeah yeah. When he, whenever he goes through the, whenever he goes through the channel tunnel the sniffer dogs go nuts for some reason nuts. yeah nuts. so um uh manish what's your choice i think they're all too tasteful i think 1987 i decided to uh just watch every single episode of miami vice i could yeah quickly watch scarface after that and then delved into uh the most obscure movie by michael mann band of the hand which had lots of pushes in it loads and loads and loads and um I think I think the big car has got to be a Lamborghini LM002. The extension sheet. Yeah, that that's thing, good. That's that, good. I mean, you pull up in that with your business associates who have a couple of Kalashnikovs and some micro scales and one of those things that counts cash. That's what you Ooh. need. And you you yeah. you basically no one's gonna mess with you. You turn up with that thing. And um yeah. The other car, I, you know, it was in an episode of Miami Vice. I think it has to be the 1987 Lamborghini Countach Quattro Valvoli, but with the side skirts, with those awful little Testarossa air intakes, you know, just at the back. Well, that's, an, that's an anniversary. No, 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 no. Before that. It's a oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. 5,000 QB, it's got the wing, it's got the really ugly skirts, it's got the great big boxes around it. federalised one. And, yeah. That I think you go white on white with that one. I think you just go white on white. That that just says powder. That just says powder. <laughs> Flower. I think you. I think you've all had a fair stab at this, but when you've heard what's about to follow, you'll realise that you've you've been found wanting. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. So this flower salesman, his only contact with the cars that he might want to buy in the future or be able to afford was through a particular card game wasn't it of course it was top trumps because there was no car tv there was no youtube he had a packet of trumps and there were two cars in a particular packet that fitted the bill perfectly so when he had the cash and the resources he bought them the first for carrying himself and his three associates and the paraphernalia the apparatus of the flower trade is a w126 500 SEL, there wasn't a 560 by then, I don't think, or there might just have been, but it's gone to AMG. I and mean, it's got all, it's got the big six litre AMG with the big carb on it. It's got some fancy wheels, but the rest of it is standard. Yeah. Um, there might be some thick glass just in case his rivals get angry with him. But whilst he's over there collecting it, he sees a car with a Mercedes engine that looks like a weird shaped supercar. And it's called the Isdira Imperator. Oh, yes. And he buys one of those because there aren't many of those in Miami. So he's gone two Mercedeses, and I still think the Imperator is the finest named, most ridiculous looking car ever. Someone turned up at the Nürburgring in Tourist and Foreign in one not long ago, and, and the, the Snappers lenses went, went mad. But I think W136 from AMG and then the Imperator. I'm, I'm yeah, sorry. I think Winning that's combo? Right. Yes, yeah, that's winning. Yeah, that's winning. Yes. You can have that. Okay, well done. Yeah. Okay, so um, some music this week. Um, I drove, I'll start. I drove 
to uh, Corman about yesterday, and I put a load of random music on. I was listening to some old Beck. Good God, he's a talented man, isn't he? There's some fantastic old albums from Beck. But then I got in a bit of a clash wormhole and um, forget what a brilliant band they were. And I have to say, Train in Vain, played very loudly in my E61 M5, is a truly brilliant tune. Go and put it on your car today, straight away. Um, uh, Manish, what's your tune? Ellery song, Imagination. Raunchiest video ever as well. Great song, sexy as hell. Very, very good tune. Edward? As I was driving into the petrol station with my in my lizard green car, thinking the police, they're not going to pull me over. I was listening to Paul Van Dyke for an angel. <laughs> bit, <laughs> bit, of, bit of dance music on Sunday afternoon before I got busted. <laughs> uh, Chris Cooper? I spent the weekend... Uh, down the members meeting and stayed with some lovely friends from Bosom Ho uh, who looked after us wonderfully and on the radio going backwards and forwards a couple of times it came on and I haven't heard it for ages but it's just such a stunning beautiful song God Only Knows by the Beach Boys oh great love a bit of Beach Boys yeah, yeah. Uh, no Clifford I've been mainly listening to Sade 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 yeah. Matthew, um, Paradise. Oh, Shardo. great song! It's a good song. Great. She was she was amazing, wasn't she? Oh, Nineteen eighty four yeah. or eighty five. I just left school. Yeah, didn't even have an MBA credit card at that point. When I when I was um, when I was a medical student, I met this guy. He was a very very big guy from Wales, accent coming, and um, he used to make a bit of money as a student being a um, a bouncer. And I remember meeting him on a Monday morning, he looked quite frazzled, and he just said, oh, they call me to, I can't do the accent. They just basically, I just can't do it. They called him to look after Sade yeah. for the weekend. And he just, he looked, he looked, just looked mesmerized. I said, are you okay? He just went, she was beautiful. You know, she, <laughs> she, she did Live Aid. If you go through the, you know, we, you can spend nine hours watching Live Aid on YouTube, can't you? But she she did Live Aid. You know, that Diamond Life album, that mid-80s yeah. feeling, everything was possible. I mean, that was a time of my life, that. Yeah, and um, I wish it was like that now. Okay, we'll, leave, we'll end on a positive <laughs> note. Um, I'm going to go and run out of fuel. My fellow addicts will uh, hopefully remain... The anxiety. And you will hopefully hear from us next week for episode 62. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.